Hi everyone and welcome to the next Firms Consulting Case Interviews and Management Consulting Podcast Series. Today I want to talk to you about, um, it's linked to a few things, but it, it links to a client discussion I had recently. And I have a client who works at a floundering retail company. Not doing so well, she's head of strategy there. And we had a few discussions because she's been relating to me, I wouldn't want to say complaining, although you could use that word if you wanted to, She's been relating to me the difficulties she's had running a department because they just don't have the resources that they need. So as a mentor, I've been asking, you know, what kind of resources? Now, how many people do you need to run the strategy department? And she's referring to resources in two ways. One is the number of people. She felt the team has been cut too much. You know, from 20 at one stage, they've been dropped to about seven people. The space of about four years, which is a big cut. And then also their access to things. You know, they've been accessing databases. They've had access to Bloomberg terminals and whatever else retailers need access to, right? And she's felt that um, her ability to be a great strategist is being impeded by the lack of acceptable to great tools that they've had before, tools slash resources. I don't agree with her at all with her assessment. And I felt it's important to share this with the community because... I feel that is the way strategy is being done now. A lot of people assume you need certain things in a certain way to be a good strategist. I'll continue the story, but I want to segue into something related to this. I recently watched a show on Hulu called The Terror, which, by the way, I should not have watched because then I had nightmares forever. And it's a story about a, a, a British, I think, expedition. I think going through the Northern Passage. I think they're trying to get to the uh, North Pole. I wasn't really paying attention. And they encounter what looks like a very, very aggressive bear. And as the series progresses, you realize that it's not really a bear. It's a spirit animal or some demon from Inuit culture that is attacking them. I stopped watching it because it became boring. There's only so much you can do with a show whereby there's two ships stuck on ice. But anyway, one of the things that's interesting here is that a lot of the early... What I realized is a lot of the early explorers, a lot of the guys that did pioneering things in the world, I mean, the guys that, usually guys, some women like Marie Curie and so on, who did pioneering things in the world, didn't have the best tools, right? I mean, can you imagine if you were the first person trying to cross the South Pole? You arrive there, you don't know, I mean, there's no uh, what's it, Canada goose to place an online order with Amazon, you arrive there, you hope your clothes fit, you've got equipment which is not designed for the ice, you've got to go out there, you've got to do readings in the freezing cold, there's no kerosene lamps to heat you up, you've got to take readings and measurements. And by and large, I can think that everyone who's developed groundbreaking thinking, at the time, the tools they were using were very, very crude, even scientists today. While the tools may look advanced, when we look back on it, it's gonna look really crude. I mean, they've got to they've got to jerry rig contraptions to measure atmospheric pressure, to measure temperature, to measure wind speed, to measure nautical miles or whatever it is there is they're measuring. So think about the guys that went on and the women that went on to do amazing things that that changed the future of mankind from a scientific perspective, from an exploration perspective. They never had good tools. None of them were pioneers because they had the best tools. Even when they had the money to build fancy contraptions, they, they had stretched that money to get the tools to do more than it intended to do. So notice this common pattern. People who do astonishing things usually don't have the best tools. They have these really rickety tools. I would personally never want to be on one of these expeditions for anything. I know there's an expedition to go and measure some kind of type of, of physical particle underground and so on. I don't want to be a part of that because I can imagine how horrible it must be. So clearly having access to the right tools is it makes your life easy, but it doesn't stop you from doing big things. So that's the one thing that you need to be comfortable. Second is that her resources dropping from 20 to seven is not a bad thing at all. The company went through a big M&A period they had a lot of people in strategy doing an M&A work. They're not doing an M&A work anymore. So why do you need them? Unless you think strategy is still M&A. And I think to a large degree, she was brought in to be head of strategy because strategy for the company at that period was M&A. But it's no longer M&A. It's about ripping out efficiencies from the existing assets. And I don't think she's geared to do that. I don't think she even knows that's her job anymore. 
Final thing, I think this is even more nuanced, is that I have never, ever, in my entire life of doing corporate strategy, and I've done a lot of corporate strategy work, and even looking at the work my partner colleagues have done, we've never, ever been in a situation whereby there was such a minor nuance of the data that forced us to change our entire strategy. Think of something today, right? Look at automation. Automation is a big thing. It's going to happen. I don't think mankind is going to come to an end. I'm not one of those people. Obviously, we've been through this before in the early 1900s when we mechanized farming and so on and industry, and we found ways to create jobs. We're going to do it again. So I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all. But the trend is there, mechanization, automation. So now, how many, how much detail, how much nuanced databases and analyses do I need to have with me to figure out a strategy on how to deal with automation? Think about companies that now want to exploit the internet. How much nuanced, in what kind of very sophisticated analysis do I need to show me that people are coming online around the world, usually through smartphones and a version of a smartphone? I mean, do I need access to databases for that? Do I need access to some unique industry-wide database to see an obvious trend? So when I look at this person, I, I almost delineate between two types of work she needs to do. The big issues you don't need massive databases for. If you can't see the big issues now, a database is not going to save you. There's something not right in the way you're looking at the world. If you are buying, if it, usually when you want databases, you're buying data from an external source. It's other people's data. When a company is in turmoil, you need to understand what is happening with your own branches, your own operations, your own plants, your own facilities, your own assets, your own liabilities. You will have that data. So though in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, okay, your company is suffering. Sales are down. They stopped doing M&A. So why do you need more people? You know what the big trends are. Stop putting ugly stores in malls. You know what's happening. You've got to shrink your footprint, break down those big stores and launch, new launch a new format, basically, right? off store data, you have that. You have lots of store data. It comes out every day. You know who's buying, when they're buying. You know what you have to do. You know how your stores are performing, but you're lamenting the fact that you are not getting access to some database that gives you access to some competitor data. That's not strategy at all. What you've done is you've gotten used or hooked or addicted to a way of doing strategy that's hooked onto some database and you think having a lot of data is going to change things. I mean, if you've seen the way we've done, if you've seen the way strategy is done, you start off with a set of hypotheses, you can come up with your storyboard and, and your, you can come up with everything you need without even looking at data just by making assumptions. It is incredibly rare where the real data that you want disagrees with the informed assumption you've made in the absence of that data. So when I see clients saying, Michael, you know, I'm in this role, but I don't have access to data. I've seen this. I mean, I have got clients who have been pulled into tech companies. And those tech companies are growing so fast to just say, look, you worked at McKinsey. You're now head of strategy. But the person doesn't really know what that means because they were usually in an EM at McKinsey and they did strategy the way McKinsey would do it. Because that's the way McKinsey does work for strategy. But when you work at a, at a real company, it's very different. You work with a company that's not slowing down while you come up with their strategy. They're not going to wait for you to pre-present. They're not going to give you access to all of the board members. They're not going to treat you with kids' gloves for six weeks to eight weeks while you develop your plans. They're not going to respect you just because you're an external person. They don't care about your benchmarks. They don't even know what a benchmark is. They don't even know why you're doing a benchmark. If you tell them a benchmark is needed to figure out the gap, to figure out how to improve things, they may not even realize they need to improve things. The great danger is to assume a good strategy thinker needs good tools. No, a good strategy thinker needs a good mind and will make the tools they have available to them work for the situation at hand. That is what you have to focus on. Now, if you look at the Corporate Strategy and Transformation Program, which is available to insiders, you can go there and you can see how I developed, how I showed you, how do you develop the overall thinking for a situation where you have no data, you don't have a problem statement, and you come up with a rough strategy. If you're not an insider, and you want to see early videos of that, if you go to firmsconsulting.com, that's F-I-R-M-S-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G.com, and you subscribe for free, or you put in your email into one of our opt-ins and so on, I believe that some of those videos are available. It's a limited time offer. We do make some of videos available to show you what's available in our advanced programs.
But don't get caught into this thinking where you think that, well, a good strategy thinker must have a lot of data, must have a lot of Excel documents, must have a lot of PowerPoint slides, must be running these big programs the way McKinsey and BCG does it. They do it for a reason, for a certain situation, for a certain context. That's their business. That's how they make their money. Of course, they're going to put a lot of song and dance around it, right? You are a strategy thinker, and a strategy thinker should be able to be able to parachute into any environment, pull that cord at the right altitude, arrive on the ground. Obviously, don't litter. Pull up your parachute in because that material takes a long time to biodegrade. Pull out a sheet of paper and be able to solve a problem. But it's certainly not developed or predicated on you having access to the most sophisticated tools. In fact, I would go so far as to say if you're someone who can only do strategy with a lot of analysis, a lot of PowerPoint, a lot of Excel documents, you're probably not a good strategy person in the first place because it's about clean, simple, classic thinking. It's about being able to strip away all of the unnecessary things that add no value and just take up a lot of time, right? It's about first principles thinking. Now, if you have any questions or if you liked anything about the show, post a comment. Tell us the things you want us to keep doing that you liked. If you have any questions, I will answer it in a follow-up podcast episode. Ciao.